Are reports that Democrats may have enough votes to repeal the measure with the help of a few Republicans to hold a one-seat advantage in the state's House and Senate. And a Boeing whistleblower says the company should stop production of its 787 Dreamliner. Boeing engineer Sam Sullenpour set to testify before a congressional committee today. This week, he told NBC he has raised concerns to his superiors about a number of issues with the plane, Boeing insisting the plane is safe. For more news with a Catholic perspective, visit EWTNnews.com. I'm Teresa Tomio, and Call to Communion with Dr. David Anders starts now. What's stopping you, you, you from becoming a Catholic? Why can't women become priests? one 288 ewtn I don't understand why I have to earn salvation. one 288 3986 Why do I need to confess my sins to a priest? What's stopping you? You, you, you? This is Call to Communion with Dr. David Anders on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. Hey, tremendous. What a, it's Wednesday. My head is spinning. My head is spinning, Dr. David Anders, as we're finally Woo! back live this week with you today. We've had some uh, major equipment upgrades in the EWTN radio department, and uh, we, are, we are trying to get the upgrades under control. So is this, is this the first live show we've done with the upgrades? It is not. It's not. Okay. No. okay. Women of Grace this morning was oh, the first live any show. Any hiccups? It was pretty good, okay, not great. bad, but we've still got some things we're working through, and uh, it's you know this is the this radio studio was constructed about ten years ago, and this is the first major rewiring of anything that's been done in there, and so there was a lot of wires in there that didn't need to be in there anymore, and so we had to wade through all that, and uh, we're we're hopefully well on our way to uh, to to getting things squared away so that we can bring the dulcet tones of Dr. David Anders to you with better quality and less effort all right got an email here he says hello i'm wen a new listener from taiwan we are currently raising funds to rebuild a church that burned down a few years ago one of the people i met asked me why don't you just ask the vatican for money they're very rich right and i couldn't answer him can you please help me respond um sure the vatican's not that rich right <laughs> to, put, to put a like to, not to put too fine a point on it so the, the vatican does have a, uh, a charitable arm, if you will. I think it's called Cor Unum, is their, is their like social service wing. And they will contribute to, say, disaster relief efforts around the world, and they, they put some money into that, but there's a finite amount to go around. And, and the, a lot of people think that the church is kind of like a, an American corporation with the Pope as CEO over a you know, sort of single organizational body. That's actually not the way the church conceives of itself. Nor is it the way the church is practically structured. Um, it's more like a, an extended family with, uh, with the Pope as the patriarch, and that actually is one of his titles, right, the patriarch, and, uh, and bishops as, uh, you know, as so many, well, you know, bosses of their own jurisdictions that are, that are autonomous, essentially, from a, from, certainly from a financial point of view, but to, but to a certain extent from a governmental point of view, as well, we're all part of one family, and there is a there is a, a, a primacy within that family. But within that family, there's a family of families, and those subordinate entities have their own autonomy and integrity. And, and bishops are legitimate um, uh, ordinaries, authorities over their own diocese, and they don't they don't get that authority directly from the pope. He he appoints them to that position, but they have the authority as successors to the apostles, and they have it in their own right as successors to the apostles. And then the priests work as their collaborators, and the and the priests are to the parishes what what uh, what bishops are to their diocese. And so, um, you know, at the individual parish level, uh, you know, parishes have to have to kind of make it on their own. If they don't, if they can't survive indefinitely on their own as parishes, they'll cease to function as parishes, and the diocese will absorb that property or redistribute it to other to other institutions. And that the church is just way, 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 way too big. Uh, for for you know one governing body to handle the financial costs of the entire thing, and most most dioceses around the world, most parishes around the world, don't have that much money. Uh, it's kind of a myth that the Catholic Church, as a collective, is just rolling in dough. I mean, the the, the general state of Catholic ministries around the world is one of uh, of never having enough money to do what they need to do. You know, 
we're creatures of habit. I know I am. And if I start to get out of my routines, I got a problem. And I started talking about all of our wonderful upgrades here at the beginning of the program, and I forgot to go through my normal informational diatribe. Yeah, well, let's have the diatribe. The diatribe is, thanks for tuning in to EWTN's Call to Communion with Dr. David Anders. Oh, yeah. If they'd like to be part of the program, if they would like to talk to you the way I have the great privilege of doing, all they have to do is pick up the phone and give us a call at 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. If you're outside the United States and Canada, we'd still love to talk to you. That number is one 205-271-2985, and we will even put you straight to the front of the line at 1-205-271-2985. And you can always send us an email. Email address is openline at EWTN.com. And we've had the triumphant return of texting. You can text your question to Dr. Anders. Simply text the letters EWTN to 58177. Wait for our response, then text us your first name and your brief question, and message and data rates in that situation may apply. I'm Jack Williams, Charles Beery producing the program. Matt Gubensky is your call screener. And I think that uh, Rich Jesse is handling our social media efforts. Or uh, that doesn't help me, Charles. <laughs> anyway, one of Ace McKay. Ace McKay is handling our social media efforts. Um, so if you're watching us on YouTube or Facebook Live, you can type a question into the chat window, and it may find its way to us by the end of the program. And we have one of those texts for Dr. David Anders, our host, who I neglected to introduce, but I think needs no introduction at this point. Um, what kind of prayer is appropriate when you pray for someone who may be in purgatory, asks Tom in Oklahoma. Well, if you're praying for that person then you ask that God have mercy on their soul, grant repose uh, and rest to their soul, and that they get out of purgatory. If you're asking for their intercession, you want the soul in purgatory to pray for you, then the appropriate prayer would be, please pray for me, right? So I, I have a number of Catholic friends and relatives who have passed on before me. They are not canonized saints, so I have no certainty that they're in heaven. I hope that they are, but they might be in purgatory. If I want their prayers, it looks something like this. Hey, would you pray for me? And by the way, while I'm at it, I'll pray for you too, right? Cover both bases. Awesome. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number. 833-288-3986. Again, if you're outside the United States and Canada, that number is 1-205-271-2985. And we will even put you straight to the front of the line at 1-205-271-2985. And texting is back. Text the letters EWTN to 58177. Wait for our response. And then just text us your first name and a brief question. And we would be happy to try to get that on the air for you. It's EWTN's Call to Communion with Dr. David Anders. Now, a quote for you from Mother Angelica's Perpetual Calendar. Our interior life can be extremely painful because you can't share it and you can't describe it. And God willed it so because it intensifies the purification. And so purification in any form, whether it's desolation or dryness or whatever it may be, is part of that growth. Mother Angelica's Perpetual Calendar is available at EWTNRC.com. That's EWTNRC.com. Hi, this is Father Mike Schmitz. Please join me for Ascension's Bible in a Year and Catechism in a Year here on EWTN Radio. We're going through the entire Bible and the Catechism in 365 days. If you've ever wanted to understand what it means to be Catholic and allow those truths to shape your life, this is for you. Bible in a Year and Catechism in a Year with Father Mike Schmitz tonight at 10 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Pacific on EWTN Radio. At EWTN Radio, your family. And because you're a part of our family, we value your opinions on what you hear on EWTN. You can call our listener comment line 24-7 at 205-795-5773 
We value your comments, your questions, and any suggestions you may have to make EWTN Radio even better. 205-795-5773. And thank you for listening to EWTN Radio. NBA. (laughs) 833-288-EWTN. That's our toll-free number. 833-288-EWTN. Three nine eight six. You know, Saturday is Mother Angelica's birthday. She would have been 101, and we're going to commemorate it in a big way here on EWTN Radio. We will have uh, Bishop Reka, our bishop here in Birmingham, is going to be, well, I don't know, actually, I don't know if it's Bishop Reka now that I say that. Somebody, we're having a mass in Rome that will be said for Mother Angelica uh, on her birthday. Uh, I know Bishop Reka was just in Rome for uh, the dedication of our new facility there, so I, I'm not sure. I don't know if he'll be the one saying it or not, uh, but we will carry that mass live for you on EWTN Radio. I can promise you that. Uh, that'll be 10 a.m. Uh, I guess Eastern Time, Mr. Producer Man Charles Beery. I'm assuming it's Eastern Time. 10 a.m. Eastern Time. We'll carry that mass, and we will have Mother Angelica themed programming throughout the day. So take EWTN Radio with you wherever you go. If you're out working in the yard, if you're washing your car, if you go to the zoo, uh, anything else, just uh, take us with you and listen and help us celebrate um, Mother Angelica and what would have been her 101st birthday. It's time to go to the phones. First up today is Emma in Cleveland, Ohio, listening on The Rock. Emma, you are on with Dr. David Anders. Hello, Dr. Anders. Hi, Emma. How are you? I am fine. And yourself? Doing great. Doing fine, thanks. Good. I have a question for you. I have a relative who calls herself a Buddhist Presbyterian. Can you explain what that is? Probably. Probably. Uh, obviously, there is no there's no institution that I'm aware of, no denomination called the Buddhist Presbyterian Church. You're not going to go and find, like, the first Buddhist Presbyterian Church of Cleveland, for example. Um, but uh, what I what I know of Protestant culture and and uh, and and the pop culture of religion, I have a kind of intuition about what that person means. I think that person is probably a practicing Presbyterian who attends a Presbyterian church, um, and uh, and you know probably believes a lot of Presbyterian doctrine as it's presented in her church. But alongside that, has developed an affinity for what she takes to be Buddhism. And, uh, and seeks to integrate some Buddhist ideas and or Buddhist practices into her, into her spirituality. And that, that kind of syncretism, that sort of blending of religious traditions, is very, very common. It's common throughout history. It's common in, uh, in the modern world. And one of the things that I've noticed, uh, and I'm sure you've noticed it as well, is that, that Buddhism has become a, a real pop culture phenomenon. And, uh, you know, there are certain... Um, let us say, environmentally friendly, health-conscious, large grocery store chains. I have one in mind in particular. Uh, and if you, if you walk into this grocery store, um, uh, you know, you're going to find, say, uh, ca- meditation calendars for sale that will have images of the Buddha or of uh, people sitting in lotus position. Uh, th- 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 this, this kind of sort of marketing push to promote Easternism, Eastern spirituality, Buddhist spirituality. It's kind of everywhere you turn. You watch popular television programs and characters uh, attain mystic powers through meditation. This this sort of thing started maybe, you know, 50 years ago. I don't know if you remember the, um, uh, the old 70s show Kung Fu, you know, the kind of uh, uh, um, valorization of, um, of Eastern uh, of Eastern spirituality as as a kind of repository of uh, of superpowers. I remember I was caught up in that as a small child. It's what inspired me to want to take martial arts. I thought anybody that could do karate was uh, was a superhero because that's the way they were always presented in the media. And it's only grown since then. And now, whether it be mindfulness practice that you find in the psychology the psychological literature or the the public persona of the Dalai Lama as a Nobel Prize winning peace activist and and alleged promoter of uh, science and spirituality. You, you name it, wherever you turn, you find media, Hollywood, um, uh, newspapers, uh, corporations really pushing this idea that Eastern spirituality is the cutting edge of, uh, of science and human progress. And so it's become quite popular, and people who I think have a, a knowledge that's probably a you know, very, very thin knowledge of Buddhism, but they're very attracted to that, 
to that ethos of, say, you know, peace and contemplation and maybe some sense of, uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, compatibility with a modern scientific worldview, try to integrate that into what other, whatever traditional form of spirituality they may be practicing. Now, you know, from my point of view, sitting back and looking at it, um, I think that's just a tremendously naive way to view the, the Buddhist tradition. And I've, it's something I've studied a lot over, over the decades, and I you know, have a graduate degree in, in religious studies, and so I've spent a lot of time in the Buddhist literature. And uh, one of the things that I've noticed is a lot of the things that pop culture valorizes about Buddhism um, are either not authentic to traditional Buddhism at all, or there are things that, that modern Buddhists have absorbed from Western culture and then repackaged as distinctly Buddhist contributions, right? So there's a, there's a phenomenon in Buddhist studies called Buddhist modernism. Sometimes it's called Protestant Buddhism, but unrelated to your friend's Buddhism. And it's a, it's a, it's a kind of uniquely modern uh, development where traditionally Buddhist cultures, when they came into contact with Western society, deliberately tried to craft their presentation of their own native religion to assimilate modern Western values, be those, you know, scientific or human rights, these kinds of issues, which were basically Western themes, were incorporated into Buddhist apologetical texts in the 20th century and then sold back to the West as if they were authentically Buddhist contributions. And so uh, I think the whole thing is, uh, is a kind of big marketing ploy, quite honestly. Thanks, Emma. We appreciate the phone call. 833-288-EWTN. That's our toll-free number. 833-288-3986. Next up is Tom in the great state of Minnesota listening on Real Presence Radio. Tom, you're on with Dr. David Anders. Good afternoon, Dr. Anders. Howdy. I have, I have a question for you. I've been trying to figure this out for several weeks, and i even asked a couple of priests who have told me, I don't know. Um, in the Bible, we find several places where we are, we are called to work. Um, but are we called in the Bible or by God tire? Uh, to, and okay. the, Go ahead. I'm sorry. The only place I could find anything that references this is Numbers, uh, in the book of Numbers 8, 23 through 26. And it says, to work in the uh, tent of service, uh, or the tent of meeting between the age of 25 and 50, and then you're to retire from work. However, that's very specifically saying for the Levites, and we're not Levites. So are we called to retire, or is this a secular thing? Yeah, thanks. I really appreciate the question. So uh, <clears throat> there is a passage in 1 Timothy chapter 5 where Paul St. Paul makes provisions specifically for uh, widows who are over the age of 60, and that's the cutoff there. So women over the age of 60 who are widows are to be enrolled in a kind of social service program where the church cares for their temporal needs. Um, and uh, in the same text, there's a general admonition not to despise the elderly, not to rebuke an older man, but to encourage them. And then there are a lot of passages of Scripture that talk about care for the elderly. They don't necessarily use the concept of retirement, and they don't necessarily link it to the old person's inability to work. But, I mean, that seems kind of obvious that if you're beyond a certain age, physical work becomes very difficult, not impossible. And there's an admonition that you are to, um, that you're to, that you're to care for such people and not let them fall through the cracks. In terms of the sort of the modern institution of retirement where you you know you work up to age 65 or whatever and then go on your 401b plan uh no obviously the economic model of modernity is very different from anything that existed in the first century um now that's that's different um you know to say well can we find all our economic models accurately reflected in the bible and if we can't does that mean there's no warrant for them I think that would be to fall into the trap of, uh, of the Protestant doctrine of the Bible, the idea that the Bible is there to give us a comprehensive answer to all questions about policy or morality or Christian theology. And that's, that's clearly not the case. The Bible doesn't function that way. It doesn't have that role in Christian life. Um, the Bible has a role in Christian life. It gives us an, an inspired account of the teaching of the apostles and of Christ and the prophets and so forth. And and, uh, and, and it's there to encourage and to edify, but it's not there to answer every question we might have. Uh, e even less so is it there to give us a comprehensive account of Christian 
uh, economic policy. And for that, we actually do have the guidance of the magisterium of the Catholic Church. And so since Pope Leo XIII, uh, the popes have developed a rather extensive body of literature in what is called the Church's Social Doctrine that ad addresses, among other things, things like personal savement, savings and retirement. So there is church teaching on this topic that's not limited to the content of the Bible, but the principles of taking care of the elderly and the recognitions that you get beyond a certain age you can't work, uh, that's also scriptural. Thanks so much, Tom. We appreciate you uh, chiming in. If that, of course, now frees up a line for you, you can reach us at 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. We're going to check in with Charlie, uh, who is in Louisville, Kentucky. First time caller listening at EWTN.com. Charlie, welcome. And what's your question for Dr. Anders? Uh, first of all, thank you, for, uh, all of you, for such a wonderful, informative program. Uh, Jesus gave us two great commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And so uh, I'm not obeying these two great commandments to the best of my abilities. And unfortunately, I'm a pretty good judge, and I judge that most people are not either. So my question is, under what condition is not obeying Jesus' two great commandments a mortal sin? Yeah, thanks. I really appreciate the question. So, first of all, let me make an observation about evaluating your ability to follow the two greatest commandments. And some people think of it this way. They think, well, you know, God is infinitely holy and infinitely good, and therefore I should put forth a kind of infinite intensity, that there's a kind of, there's a kind of intensity to my pursuit of God that ought to match the divine dignity. And since God's infinite— um, you know, it would seem like there's always some greater marginal difference that I could make. You know, I recently read James Clear's book, Atomic Habits, and he talks about making those 1% incremental improvements, and eventually if you add up enough 1% improvements, you've got a 1,000% improvement in your life, right? Mm. And I think some people think, well, you know, I, I ought to be able to squeeze another 1% out of my love of God and neighbor, and you can keep doing that, and of course you'll never do better than an asymptotic approach to the divine infinity, and you'll always fall short if that's the way you're gauging what it means to obey, to love the Lord God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Now, that that's basically to set yourself up for failure so that it is impossible to obey the command, right? Now, that that's the way I was trained in the Protestant tradition, and say the Calvinists, for example, would teach that it is intrinsically impossible to obey these commandments because of that kind of reasoning. Well, it's not the Catholic view. Catholic view is that it is, in fact, possible to obey these commandments, that God does not, does not command the impossible. And in fact, the, the Council of Trent, Session 6, Chapter 16, which I recommend you go take a look at, by the way, says that for any soul that's in the state of grace, for any soul that's in the state of grace, the good works that you do in grace are understood as fulfilling the greatest two commandments. And so that means, you know, according to your state of life. So if you're a five-year-old kid, for example, and, uh, and you, you give your mother a birthday card um, in the state of grace, you know, for the, for the love of your mother and for honoring your parents and so forth, you give her a birthday card, that you've merited eternal life by handing her a birthday card. Right. Because, like, for a five-year-old, that's your state of life. Like, that's, that's what you can do, you know. Um, let's say you're a husband, and according to your state of life and your vocation, what you need to do is be faithful to your wife and provide for your children and their religious upbringing. And, uh, and, and you get up in the morning and you're faithful to your wife and you go to work and you make a living and you take care of your kids and you take them to Mass and pray with them and listen to them when they're having trouble and you get to care for them. And you've done that in the state of grace for the sake of the love of God and neighbor. Well, you've merited eternal life in doing that. In living the duties of your state of life, you have merited eternal life. So that uh, that's, that feels like lowering the bar a little bit, but but I think it's an accurate way to to think about the obedience to those two greatest commandments. Now, another way I think people go wrong when you say, "Well, you know, do I love God?" Again, I'm going to contrast this with the way I grew up and the way I now understand it as a Catholic. When I was growing up, I thought that people who loved God were people who talked about God a lot, people who, say, committed the Bible to memory, and they could throw a Bible verse at you every time you turned around, people who seemed to pray at the drop of a hat. In fact, you know, you say hello to them, and the next thing you know, that they're, they're just sort of 
inundating you with prayer, and they're going to lift you up, brother, to the Lord, and may the God bless you. And every every time there's an issue, every time there's a problem, it's like, well, I'll take, let's just take this to the Lord in prayer. So the person who's sort of saturated, visibly, demonstrably saturated with piety is the fellow who loves the Lord. That That's the way I thought growing up. And uh, that's not the way the Catholic Church treats it, actually. And, and you may not have realized this now, maybe not, but you can meet a lot of people who have a kind of... Uh, really demonstrative piety where every other word out of their mouth is about God, and they can be very far from what the church means by the love of God. St. John of the Cross once said, there are many people who pray quite badly that are convinced that they pray well. And there are people who pray very well who are convinced that they pray badly. And, and you know, the, the real index of whether or not you are a pious person, whether or not you love God, um, isn't so much how much do you talk about God, how many scriptures can you quote. God, in the Catholic scheme of things, is just the ground and origin of all that's true, good, and beautiful. St. Paul references this obliquely in Philippians when he says, finally, brother, whatsoever things are true or noble or praiseworthy or you know, worthy of good report, think about such things. And uh, to the extent to which I'm committing my life to the pursuit of the good, the true, and the beautiful— um, and I'm seeking to bring my moral life into accord with that, to that extent I'm loving God. And it doesn't necessarily require a kind of showy piety, as it were. Um, so that's only half of your question. Let will get to the other half on the other side of the break. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number, 833-288-3986. It's EWTN's call to communion with Dr. David Anders. Proclaiming the faith, changing lives. The year was 2011. EWTN launches a new television network in Germany that will air Catholic programming 24 hours a day on one of the world's largest providers of direct-to-home satellite services. To learn more about Mother Angelica's life and the history of EWTN, visit EWTN.com slash Mother Angelica. Hi, I'm Al Cresta. Join me for a daily conversation about the things that matter most on Cresta in the Afternoon, this afternoon, 4 Eastern, on EWTN Radio. This is a Digital Moment with Sandra McDevitt. Did you know making a garden dedicated to Our Lady is a very old tradition? The first recorded garden dedicated to the Blessed Mother was by St. Faker in the 7th century. During medieval times, plants and flowers were named after a certain aspect of Our Lord or Our Lady. Here are a few for Our Lady. Baby's Breath, Our Lady's Veil. Columbine, Our Lady's Slippers. Bleeding Heart, Mary's Heart. Forget Me Not, Our Lady's Eyes. Fox Glove, Our Lady's Gloves. Lily of the Valley, Our Lady's Tears. And Impatience, Our Lady's Earrings. Lots of information on the internet or library to get started. A small Mary statue, your yard, or planter boxes is all you need. Time to start planting your Mary garden and make it a family tradition. I'm Sandra McDevitt, BW10 Radio. EWTN. On the next More to Life, Love Lost. Are you having a hard time loving someone or feeling loved by them? Let us help. That's on the next More to Life. Now back to Call to Communion with Dr. David Anders. Hey, 33288-EWTN. That's our toll-free number, 833-288-3986. Talking to Charlie, a first-time caller in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, Dr. Anders, you got through about half of it. Yeah, so his question was, what does it mean to love God and your neighbor and then... How far short of that can I fall without imperiling my soul? And so the first half of the break, before the break, I was saying, look, you know, the church says that it's possible to do this. Anything you do, any good deed you do, according to your vocation, your state of life, uh, you're understood to have been loving God and loving neighbor appropriately. So it's not out of reach for Catholic people, and you shouldn't judge it as a kind of sort of maximal intensity, as if you always had to hit, you know, had to, had to make a personal best every time you went to the spiritual gym, you know, the way you would gauge your progress in uh, athletic performance. It's not to be viewed that way. It's not sort of the intensity of the output that measures it. 
it really is, you know, is the orientation of your life towards the good, the true, and the beautiful to do the rational good for yourself and others as a human person according to your state of life. That's the way you gauge love of God and neighbor. The question, how far off the mark can I be without being in the state of mortal sin? Well, if you if if your deviation from the rule of right reason, and that is the rule of human moral behavior, the rule of right reason, if your deviation from the rule of right reason uh, involves a kind of gross violation of human or divine dignity, then that's what we call grave matter, which is potentially mortal sin. And, um, you know, to give an example, um, uh, if, your, if your great aunt asks you what you think of her new hat, um, and you answer dishonestly and say you look lovely, uh, that is probably not grave matter. Uh, if you, if you, it's not grave matter. If you take an, uh, uh, an oath in court to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God, in a capital case, and you bear false witness against your neighbor, um, uh, such that, you know, you acquit a guilty person or send an innocent person to the gallows, that would definitely be grave matter, right? And so, so you, you would gauge loving God and neighbor against the standards uh, of, uh, of mortal sin versus venial sin. 833-288-EWTN. That's our toll-free number. Russ is in the great state of Delaware listening on Sirius XM Channel 130. Russ, you're on with Dr. David Andrews. Uh, Dr. Hyde, this is, uh, the, the reason I call, there's two things that I'm really confused about. Uh, at my age, probably more than that. But at any rate, uh, on the Shroud of Turin, um, 30... Uh, um, scientists said uh, this is a fraud yet they can't figure where the image came from and uh there's been some surveys done with the pollen that they dated all the way back to christ and i know they took the samples from an area that was destroyed by fire but um that i was just wondering um is there any validity in that that, that it, it's that this relic is really true and then the other one is on about the Lady of Guadalupe, Gal- um, where 90,000 um, people de- uh, had a, or Indians converted to Catholicism. Yet, I, and I, when I checked with uh, Catholic Answer, that comes out. But then all at once Google pops in and says, uh, no, Cortez made the 90,000. They he. Okay, sure. I, I can speak to both of those questions. All right. So um, uh, here at EWTN, you will find a lot of people who are uh, very interested in the Shroud of Turin and believe in its authenticity, and a lot more people who are really interested in Our Lady of Guadalupe and obviously are, are very committed to the his- historical truth of the narratives surrounding those apparitions. Um, that being said... A Catholic is not obligated to hold any particular opinion about either of those things because neither one of them is the subject of Catholic dogma. And so the, the one thing that a Catholic absolutely must hold as an article, as faith, with the supernatural virtue of faith, are the dogmas of the Catholic faith, those things the Catholic faith has put forth as public revelation taught by Jesus and the apostles. And since Jesus and the apostles had nothing to say about Marian apparitions that happened after the ascension of Christ— or about the Shroud of Turin, those are matters of theological opinion, and Catholics may legitimately hold different points of view. Um, Even if some point of view is very popular and predominant, a Catholic's not obligated to hold it. And I I tell you that because um, you, you ought to do the investigation for yourself and feel utterly at ease in your mind in going where the evidence leads you, right? Because Catholics have a very healthy respect for human reason, and believe that faith and reason can always be reconciled. And sometimes that means that the position that is, you know, we might say the faith point of view, if you will, um, the supernaturalist point of view, has pride of place, and we, and we realize that we've made a mistake in our human reason. Other times we may make a mistake in our theology, and some discovery in natural science or natural reason shows us that we've made a mistake in our theological reasoning, and we accommodate that to the science. And an example would be the Galileo affair, when uh, most Catholics in the 16th century would have believed that uh, that the sun went around the earth, 
they believe that because of the authority of Aristotle, but also because of what they thought Scripture taught. And uh, when Galileo came around and argued for the Copernican hypothesis, um, Cardinal Bellarmine, who was the chief Vatican theologian at the time, said, well, I think you're wrong, and I think Scripture says you're wrong, but if you can show me from the science, you can show me empirically that the earth grows around the sun, then obviously I've made a mistake in the way I was interpreting the Bible, because the Bible's not going to contradict science. It was me who made the mistake, not the Bible. It was the way I'd interpreted it that was wrong, and I'll go back and I'll reinterpret accordingly. That's an, and, and, of course, Church did that. I mean, eventually, 100 years later, Galileo's hypothesis had been verified by empirical observation, and the Church said, oh, yeah, okay, I guess, I guess we read Genesis the wrong way, right? And that's always the Catholic's disposition. It's not to say the science or the reason or the evidence are just flat out wrong because the Bible says so. It's to say, let me, let me go where the evidence leads, whether it be the biblical evidence, uh, the evidence of divine revelation, or the evidence of natural reason, <clears throat> and then do my dead little best to reconcile those. And the whole time, I'm utterly at peace. Like, I don't care where the cards fall, because I trust that God is the God of nature and revelation, you see. So whatever whatever is true is true, and I'm good with truth. I'm not, I'm not threatened by truth wherever it might be found. So whenever you have these kinds of questions, do the research. You Read the experts. I'm not an expert in these issues. You're probably not either. Uh, read different points of view, read different scholars, read Catholic scholars, read non-Catholic scholars. You follow the evidence to the best of your ability, and then be at peace in your mind. And so I'm personally, because I'm not uh, an expert in the relevant sciences, I can't tell you. I mean, I, I, I can tell you people who will give you arguments. And so Father Robert Spitzer, who is a host on EWTN and a pretty eminent uh, thinker, has done a lot of work on the authenticity of the Shroud of Turin, and if you want a very compelling argument for its authenticity, then look up Father Robert Spitzer, some of the stuff he's done from the network and in other places, and you will find a compelling argument for the authenticity of Father Spitzer. But I think Father Spitzer himself would be the first person to tell you um, it's okay to read competing points of view and weigh those as well, and then you can make up your mind. 833-288-EWTN. That's our toll-free number, 833-288-3986. Great new book from EWTN Publishing from the month of April, Spiritual Lightning. And, <clears throat> excuse me, Answering Your Call from Jesus to Master His Values by Deacon Richard Eason, who was on campus a uh, couple weeks ago. Uh, St. Paul was struck down by divine power from a bolt of spiritual lightning. In our own lives, we also experience moments of spiritual lightning, whether subtly, dramatically, or circumstantially. Uh, through this uh, book of his personal anecdotes and uh, some inspiring stories, uh, the deacon reveals how to develop strength and courage during times of suffering and ways to obtain healing, and he shows you how to garner the benefits of autopilot faith and develop trust in God through prayer leading to positive transformation, spiritual tranquility, and increased joy and happiness. Great new book, Spiritual Lightning, answering your call from Jesus to master his values by Deacon Richard Eason, available now at EWTN's Religious Catalog by Catholic Shop, EWTNRC.com. John is up next, a first-time caller in Austin, Texas, listening on the EWTN app. John, thanks for holding. Welcome to the program. Yes, good afternoon. Um, Dr. Anders, I was um, very interested in your take on, on my situation as a lifelong Protestant um, for now six, five or six decades. But, but having received a, an unexpected phone call from my son in college, who was at a Protestant Christian college in the Northeast, um, he asked me, "Who? guess who I played chess with today? And, of course, I had no idea. And he said, Dr. Peter Kraft. And, and of course, I, I didn't know who that was. And, and long story short, within a year, he had converted to Catholicism. Um, he was a visiting professor of philosophy at his college. And, and so I'm always very interested in, in my children's um, goings on, and began to read some of his books, and that, and one thing led to another, and and then that led to reading, you know, the early church fathers, and on and on and on, and and I'll not tarry, but I'm now four, three or four years into this process, 
and and really wondering at what point, um, after having assented to many of the Catholic dogmas, um, and maybe not checking every box, I'm 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 somewhat um, con- maybe concerned is not the right word, but at some point my my you know my conscience uh-huh. is direct is directing me. Yep, yep, yep. You're saying all the right things. You're saying all the right things. And and John, been there, done that. All right. I know of what you speak. So um, when you're you said up to now you've been Protestant. As a Protestant, would you describe yourself as a as a, a devout believer? You take the Bible seriously. Very. Yes. Okay. So in your relationship to the Bible as a Protestant, would you ever have said? I understand everything in the Bible. Of course not. No. Um, would you admit there are portions of Scripture that strike me as very problematic and taken out of context? If I encountered these texts, just sort of, you know, if I pulled them out of some, you know, book of ancient history and I read them out of context, I might even say, man, I don't know how somebody could believe that. Um, because they really do pose a challenge. But but bound together, you know, under uh, within the canon of the Bible, you know, they have a place in salvation history, and I may still have a problem with them. But I can implicitly trust that God knew what He was doing when He put them there, and when He put them in the history of the people of God. And so, even though I can't figure it out, I do have this kind of implicit trust that if it's in the Word of God, it's true at some level. And there's some way to integrate this intelligently into my Christian life. Would you say that would accurately describe your disposition? I, I would. Um, yes, su- su- surprisingly so, um, Dr. Anders. Okay. All right. And, if that's the case, and, if that's the case, if you, ha- as a Protestant, understand what it feels like to have an implicit trust in the Bible, even though the Bible comes with problems— that's the disposition you bring to the Catholic faith. You say, the data set is bigger, right? We have the Bible plus. We have the Bible plus the sacred tradition of the Church and the teaching of the living magisterium. But you've already formed the habit of implicit faith. You already know what it feels like to submit your intellect and your will to an authority that you don't totally understand, knowing that you're going to have to assimilate stuff that doesn't presently make sense. That's what you do when you become Catholic. You say, I believe everything the Catholic Church declares to be revealed by God. Even though at this point, I may not understand it all, and I may not see how to integrate it. Now, but I think that it's easier to make an act of faith in the Catholic Church than it is to make an act of faith in the Bible alone, right? Looking back on it, in my life, having been Protestant and now being Catholic, and here's why. Because the, the Protestant promise is that the Bible is internally consistent, at least if, you, if you're a conservative Protestant, a sort of traditional Protestant. The view is that the Bible is internally consistent and that its, that its, its meaning is sort of plain, right? It's what the Protestants call the perspicuity of Scripture, the idea that I can, I can just sort of read the Bible at the surface level, exegete the plain meaning of the text— and there's a way to integrate all of the Bible teaching into one system. That's the discipline of systematic theology is based on that in Protestantism. And, and uh, I think that's a very difficult thing to do, actually. I think it's very hard to make the Bible speak with one clear, plain voice if you read it all at a level in that way. But the Catholic Church says the Bible doesn't work that way, that the Bible actually has levels of meaning, and that sometimes the surface meanings are in open contradiction with one another, and that you have to dive deeper to the spiritual sense of the text, reading it as it, in light of the, the canon and the tradition of the Church in order to make sense of it. And the larger superstructure for interpreting the Bible is a Catholic tradition that is demonstrably internally consistent and very committed to the principle of reason. And so once you understand the larger picture of, say, Catholic hermeneutics, how Catholics interpret sacred texts, I find it much easier 
to make an act of faith and divine revelation as a Catholic. There, there's fewer intellectual contortions. There's less of an assault on my sense of intellectual integrity as a Catholic than there was as a Protestant. Does that make sense to you? I'm afraid that's far too helpful and makes far too much sense. Okay. So the um, next question I have for you is about the question of your conscience. You said your conscience was beginning to kind of nudge you in the direction of the Catholic faith. When that starts happening, uh, in, in my view, the, the momentum um, is picking up in your journey to the Catholic faith. And at some point, uh, only one of two or three things has to happen. All right. One is that you just follow your conscience straight into the Catholic Church. Um, a- another one is that you ignore your conscience. You, you, you quiet your conscience, and you make the decision to disobey conscience because it is really inconvenient in your life right now to follow conscience. And if you're like a lot of us, one of the inconveniences may be members of your family. Maybe your wife is not excited about the Catholic thing. Maybe your other children aren't excited about the Catholic thing. Maybe... Uh, um, you know, maybe your friends, your professional relationships are not excited about the Catholic thing. So it's inconvenient. So you just make a decision to ignore conscience. The other possibility is maybe you run into a hiccup in the road and you, your confidence in the Catholic faith is shaken. But, but that doesn't look like the third one is what's is coming down the pike for you, right? Right now it looks like this is a question of do I follow conscience or do I suppress conscience? In my life, I got to the point where Failure to become Catholic was disobedience to conscience. And I personally could not live as an intellectually honest Christian without becoming Catholic. I knew if I failed to become Catholic, then I was going to be a hypocrite, and I would be good to no one. And so I made the decision, personally, I made the decision to become Catholic so that I wouldn't be in that position. And I think that's ultimately the point that you have to come to. When you get to the place where Unless I become Catholic, I'm in disobedience to conscience. And when that happens, well, then it's, then it's, a, it's a done deal. Like, you, you, you can't disobey conscience. I mean, you can, but that's mortal sin. Like, once conscience has convicted you, this is the church that Christ founded, and I have to join it, you have to join it. Now, do you have to join tomorrow? No, no. But you have to make a decision to join, and you have to start arranging your life in a way that makes it possible. And so let's say your wife doesn't want you to join. Well, you don't, you know, you just missed last Easter, right? So you got a year to go for the next time you could come in the church. Um, you know, you, you can start taking baby steps in the direction of how can I, how can I smooth the path? Uh, how can I make this palatable to my family? Uh, one thing you don't have to do is give all of your reasons to everyone that you talk about, to everyone that you talk to. You know, as, uh, Jack likes to tease me about my diet because I'm a vegan. I don't eat meat. And, uh, you know, if you've heard the old joke, why did the vegan cross the road? It's to tell you that he's a vegan, right? You know, vegans are bad about telling you that they're vegans. And, um, and you don't have to be like the Catholic vegan, you know, who's like walking across the road going, hey, I'm joining the Catholic Church. Don't you want to join me? Let me give you, all the, let me give you the, the, the 15 best apologetical arguments I've ever heard for becoming Catholic, because quite frankly, they don't care right now. You have to make them care by the quality of your life. When, when they see that something's different about you, then they can say, so why did you become Catholic after all? Okay, well, you know, here's why, right? So you don't have to wear it on your shirt sleeve, and you can be sensitive to the people around you, but ultimately you do have to follow conscience. God bless you, John, and one great thing you've done is called the program, so you'll have a lot of folks praying for you as your discernment continues. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number. Sharon is in Seattle, Washington, listening on Sacred Heart Radio. Sharon, you're on with Dr. Andrews. Thank you, Dr. Anders, for surrendering to Jesus in the way that heals and brings good and freedom to us, his body. The question that I have for you is from Scripture, which I never understood, and I do not know the reference. However, it's a Scripture that says we, as Christians, are to inform the powers and principalities on high. And the question is, what are we to inform them of? Because my assumption is that they are already informed. Can you address that, please? Yeah, sure, sure. So so throughout the writings of St. Paul in particular, and also to a certain extent of St. Peter and his epistles, um, we see a picture of a, of a cosmos in conflict, not just humans against humans, but of spiritual forces and powers in the heavenly realms that are locked in, uh, that are locked in combat. 
And Christ, of course, has defeated the malicious powers of the enemy and the spirits of the air and the demons and so forth. And uh, there's a lot in Scripture that that suggests that Christ's triumph of, uh, of the cross was not only a triumph against the uh, the existential existential state of sin and guilt, but against active antagonistic forces. That it was a defeat of actual powers and principalities, defeat of demonic forces, and that the triumph of the vic of the Christian Church is a kind of victorious display, and. Uh, the the image that comes to mind is you know if you're a Roman emperor and you you're you know you 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 wage a campaign against the Mediterranean pirates or against the barbarians or something, when you conquered your enemies, what you would do is you'd go out and uh, and uh, put them in chains, and lead them in a triumphal uh, procession through the city of Rome, and so you'd come back literally with your enemies dragged behind you in chains, and the the crowds in Rome would would cheer as they saw their you know their their uh, uh, their traditional enemies being humiliated. That's the picture we get in Scripture of what Christ has done to the powers. And, and uh, the, the, the irony is that the persecution of the apostles, and this is Paul's language, his own, his own humiliation is part of this triumphal assembly, but procession, because Jesus' death, it was Christ's passion that was the victory over the evil powers, and by joining himself to the shape of Christ's cruciform life, by imitating Christ in his sufferings and being subject to persecution, Paul himself is putting on display the power of the gospel to the defeat of the enemies. And, uh, you know, th th this plays out in an interesting way in, in salvation history. In the Old Testament, the idea of victory over enemies is absolutely endemic. So when God promises Abraham that he's going to have a great nation come forth from him, part of the promise is, and your progeny will occupy the cities of their enemies. Um, when, uh, when Moses leads the people out in the Exodus, it's through a, a military defeat of the Egyptian army. Uh, when David receives the promise of an eternal kingdom, God promises to give him rest from his enemies on all sides. Um, the prophets, like Ezekiel, when they look forward to the kingdom of God and the return from the exile, specifically talk about God uh, overthrowing horse and rider and throwing them into confusion. So the military theme is, is very pronounced. Um, in the New Testament, it shifts, and it's no longer the, uh, the military conquest of human enemies. It is the conquest of principalities and powers. Now, here's the interesting connection. In the Old Testament, um, the, the gods of the nations are understood as being demonic hordes. And, and that connection is made explicitly in the Greek Old Testament, the, the Septuagint. They're called demons. And so the idea is sort of if you defeat the demons, the gods of the nations, you kind of get the people and the land to boot. And the way it actually turned out in history was that by converting people to the Christian faith, right, by, by actually making converts and, and causing people to renounce their ancestral gods, that, that territorial nations were actually brought within the Christian fold. And so you didn't actually have to wage a military warfare to see the lion lie down with the lamb. Some of those prophetic expectations of, say, like temporal peace, not all of them, but some of them, were actually fulfilled through spiritual means. And so the conquest of principalities and powers wasn't a mere abstraction, wasn't a kind of just a plain superstition. It actually had real consequences at the human societal level. Thanks so much, Sharon. We appreciate that phone call. We have run flat out of time today. Uh, Renee, if you'd like to hold on the line, Father Mitch Pack was going to be in the house shortly. We'd be happy to take your phone call then. Otherwise, give us a call back at another time. Uh, we do this program Monday through Friday every day at 2 p.m. Eastern time with Dr. David Anders. And on behalf of Dr. Anders, our producer, Charles Beery, our call screener, Matt Gubensky, and our social media maven, Mr. Ace McKay. I'm Jack Williams sitting in today for Tom Price. Thanks so much for tuning in. We are back at it again tomorrow. Same time, same channel right here at 2 p.m. Eastern time on EWTN's Call to Communion with Dr. David Anders. God bless.
Hey, this is Michael O'Neill, the Miracle Hunter. I'll be delving into the fascinating world of miracles and taking you on a hunt that explores the greatest mysteries and marvels of the